that I commend Dr. Work is going to get into really the nitty gritty of how these two uh, are related. So I'd like to start um, my portion of the talk tonight with a patient case like we do for a lot of our medical school lectures. So a 37 year old man comes into your clinic and he's concerned about his heart. His father has just passed away at 58 years old from a heart attack. And your patient is nervous about his own heart and he wants to know what he can do to stay healthy. You hear his concerns and you understand how he, um, why he's anxious about this. You ask a little bit more questions about his history to get an idea of what his risk factors might be. You ask him about his exercise. He says he does so about once a month. By profession, he's a welder and he considers himself pretty physically active. He's on his feet, moving around all day. In terms of alcohol, he consumes about two to three beers on the weekends and that's about it. He has smoked an average of a pack of cigarettes a day for the last 19 years. He just stopped two months ago when his father passed away, thinking that this would contribute to a heart attack uh, and his risk of heart attack in the future. In terms of his diet, he eats what he thinks is a, a normal diet, an average diet. Uh, when you listen further and ask what did he have today for breakfast, he had a McDonald's egg McMuffin and a hash brown. For lunch, a turkey sandwich and potato chips. And for dinner, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and gravy. So back to his original concern, how can you help this patient? How can you help make sure that his heart is as healthy as possible? So let's get a little bit into the 101 of cardiovascular disease, starting with the term itself. The cardiovascular system consists of the heart and the blood vessels. This diagram here shows the heart in the middle of this person. The red arteries are uh, colored on the left side of the person and the veins, the blood returning to the heart is colored in blue. The whole system is where we can find diseases. Uh, and those include all those listed on the right hand side of the slide. High blood pressure, also known as hypertension, coronary heart disease, heart attack, also known as myocardial infarction, and stroke, known as cerebrovascular disease. These diseases affect different parts of the uh, cardiovascular system, but they all comprise cardiovascular diseases. In terms of the scope of the problem, almost half of all Americans have cardiovascular disease, inclusive of all those ones we just listed. About 23 0.1% of Americans will pass away from heart disease, heart disease specifically in, within cardiovascular diseases. This makes cardi um, uh, heart disease one of the leading causes of death in the country. And within those that pass away from heart disease, 42.1% of those will pass away from coronary heart disease specifically. So what is coronary heart disease? Coronary heart disease is a narrowing of the small blood vessels that supply blood and oxygen to the heart itself. This diagram here shows a heart uh, that the heart muscle is um, being encircled by my mouse. Coming off of it is the red aorta. And right at the beginning of the aorta are branches of arteries known as the coronary arteries. These branches of our arteries go right back into the heart muscle and feed the heart muscle itself. It, it's something, uh, honestly, I didn't know until I went to medical school that the heart itself needed a blood supply. Um, but in fact, uh, it, the heart muscle needs to get blood and oxygen fed into it for it to work. These coronary arteries um, are really important because they keep your heart working. And over time, they can have fatty, deposits build up. These fatty deposits are known as plaque. This happens over the lifespan as well as, like we'll talk about some other factors, increasing the risk of you developing uh, fatty deposits in your coronaries. When a plaque ruptures in the coronary artery, this fills the artery with a blood clot, causing a heart attack. This diagram here shows that progression. 
uh, a coronary plaque builds up over time and reaches a point at which it is at risk of rupture. When it ruptures, this ca causes activation of the clotting cascade within your blood, forming a thrombus, cutting off blood supply to the part of the heart being fed by that coronary artery, thus causing death of the heart muscle and a heart attack. So what increases our risk for coronary disease? Some of these things are biologic. Coronary disease is higher in males than it is in females. Coronary disease, like I already alluded to, increases with age. And among immediate family members who have coronary disease, the risk of coronary disease is higher, implying a genetic component, some of which we know spe the specific genes, uh, to uh, the risk for coronary disease. All of these things are not really modifiable. We can't do anything about these risk factors per se. But there are some things that we can do. Like our patient in the case I opened with did, uh, we can avoid smoking. And this is one of the more dramatic risk factors where soon after cessation of smoking, the risk of coronary, uh, uh, of, uh, coronary disease goes down. We can control our blood pressure and lower our cholesterol. This can be done through medications and this will uh, help prevent coronary disease. We can exercise and we can eat healthy. And that's gonna be one of the main focuses for our talk today. But this begs the question, which is what exactly is healthy eating? So uh, I don't think, uh, 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 anyone here is um, um, uh, probably unaware of the um, part of our popular culture that diet and what we're supposed to eat is a pretty confusing topic. I pulled these Im uh, images off of the web pretty quickly to illustrate the fact that diet and diet fads keep our head spinning with what we're, we're supposed to consume. Um, and, you know, it's all a part of fat and, 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 and it's heavily intermixed with our culture and our, our so, a social a socialization. But the reality is there's actually quite a bit of literature out there, medical and scientific, about what healthy eating is. Um, these organizations, the World Health Organization, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, among others, all have published guidelines on what healthy eating is and how it can help us reduce our risk of heart disease. So looking at their guidelines and synthesizing them, some common features become readily apparent. Some things we're meant to emphasize in our diet. One of those is energy balance. That energy balance being how much we are eating and how much we're expending. So what is our physical activity relative to the amount of food we're taking in? Um, keeping that in balance and therefore maintaining um, body weight and not increasing our body weight is an important part of a healthy diet. Fruits and vegetables, this is perhaps one of the most core parts of the dietary recommendations in these guidelines. Centering fruits and vegetables in our diets helps everything else fall in line as far as the rest of our diet goes. Um, the core of a healthy diet is fruits and vegetables and eating as many of them as we can is going to help us have a healthy diet. Whole grains. Whole grains include all parts of the grain, that is the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. Um, this is in contrast to what you might know as refined grains like white rice and white flour. Um, instead, eating foods that have the whole grain within them promotes um, a healthy diet. Legumes, uh, beans, soybeans, uh, split peas, chickpeas, foods in this class are high in protein, and high in fiber, and therefore are part of a healthy diet. We are also 
We're supposed to minimize certain things in our diet. Minimize or eliminate, I should say. Sugar, added sugars, ref added refined sugars, sugary beverages, all of these are um, really don't have a role in uh, maintaining a healthy diet. Salt, there's a direct relationship between salt and increased blood pressure. Minimizing our salt intake is a way to keep our blood pressure down and therefore reduce um, uh, our risk of heart disease. So minimizing salt intake is important. Um, processed foods. Uh, so processed foods is uh, I, somewhat of a, uh, of a broad term, but this is these are foods that have undergone an industrial process to make the, uh, the nutrients within them more uh, uh, simple sugars, and they contain colorings and additives and preservatives, all of which are not a part of a healthy diet. And so minimizing those or eliminating those is uh, going to be healthful. And finally, there are some things that we should exchange. Animal protein, particularly red meat, and exchanging it for fish and plant sources of protein is a part of healthy eating. And in terms of fats, exchanging saturated fats, that is um, uh, animal fats, butter, uh, coconut oil, fat that is so, uh, solid room temperature, exchange, exchanging those and trans fats for unsaturated fats, the, can, you can think of olive oil and um, sunflower oil and flaxseed oil, all of those which are liquid at room temperature are more healthy than saturating fats. So those kind of uh, give you an overview of the dietary pattern that is good for our heart. Um, in the next part of the talk, Rob is going to get into how um, these things actually promote health and the, the, the uh, um, biological basis for this. These are the references um, the, uh, for the portion of my talk. And um, with that, I'm happy to take questions before we get into more of the nitty gritty uh, on this topic with Dr. Worka. Ben, thank you very much for that great talk. Um, and so to the participants tonight, uh, please put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and Kevin and I will moderate the chat um, to ask uh, to either unmute you or ask the question for you, depending on what your preference is. Um, but in the meantime, while people are thinking about their questions, I have one that I can ask you, Ben. Um, so early in the talk, you started to mention that um, the coronary arteries, the arteries around the heart, have these um, develop these plaques, um, and I was wondering. Um, can you have those plaques and have no symptoms? And uh, do the plaques have to rupture? Great question. Um, it is uh, possible, certainly, to have uh, plaques in your coronary arteries and have no symptoms. There's a point at which the plaque buildup will start to cause symptoms, the, the chiefs among them being chest pain when you're exerting yourself. Um, uh, so you can have development of the plaque with, uh, w before you reach that point, um, which is why uh, uh, prevention before plaque buildup starts is, is so important, right? Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, Nate, I think there was a second part of your question that I might be forgetting. Um, I think the question was, do the plaques have to rupture? And uh, so uh, another good question. I, so when, what causes plaque rupture? Um, I think is uh, beyond what, what my knowledge base is it, it, for exactly what causes it. Um, I think part of it has to do with exactly um, what the plaque is, like what, what kind of shape it is, but Dr. Worka maybe can tell us more. Um, uh, but the, they don't have to rupture, not all plaques rupture. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Um, and I think we have a few questions uh, coming in into the chat now. Uh, yeah, I... Gretchen was raising her hand, so I'm just going to allow you to talk, Gretchen. Hi. So um, I have a question about like health and like nutrition. So I'm a vegan, and I've been a vegan for about two and a half years. But recently, I started running, 
and I'm a little bit worried about like making sure that I have the right protein intake and all that stuff. So in order, like I'm not being vegan to lose weight in order to be healthy on a vegan diet, what do you think um, are things I should like focus on? Thanks for your question, Gretchen. Um, I, uh, I, I want to uh, also say that uh, I, I am a medical student and not a nutritionist. So I, I want to off, offer that caveat with my advice. Um, and also say that um, I, what, I what I have read so far um, and synthesized from the professional guidelines mostly pertains to um, the, uh, um, how diet helps us avoid uh, cardiovascular disease. That being said, um, I think the um, sort of general recommendations that I offered um, uh, or at least that I was able to synthesize from the guidelines um, can help for overall health and overall well-being. Um, so I think focusing on, um, as I showed at the beginning of the slide, um, energy balance so that you're uh, taking in enough uh, uh, food and, and um, uh, also balancing that with physical activity, focusing on fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, all of those will um, uh, 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 form the core of a, a healthy diet, including a vegan diet. Okay, thank you. Um, I think one thing that we may want to add as well is there's some vitamins that you get mostly from consuming meat, like vitamin B12. Um, and not having vitamin B12 can cause some pretty significant anemias and sort of neurologic things. Um, but you can supplement that with a um, multivitamin. And so um, if you are worried about that or are feeling tired or just want to supplement your diet with a vitamin, um, that would be a good way to just make sure you don't get um, any sort of major, um, major dietary problems. I think our next question um, is from uh, Nihar Rama. Um, Kevin, do you want to unmute her or I can actually unmute her? Here we go. Oh, I think Kevin and I are opposite doing. <laughs> yep. Here, I'll go. All right, you should be able to unmute now. Sorry about that. Hi, Nihar. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so my question was um, about how dietary guidelines change over time. So for example, the American Heart Association or WHO, they often update these guidelines with new data that comes out. And so I just wanted to know if uh, Ben had any tips for how to keep up with those changing guidelines. Uh, great question. Um, I can't say I have any tips <laughs> um, because I wouldn't say that I'm a, um, a, a, um, a, a student of the guidelines for a long period of time. Uh, but uh, that being said, um, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's important to um, to um, like what, with consumption of all medical information, try to try to look for reliable sources of information and avoid those that don't um, have uh, scientific backing, have professional backing. Um, uh, uh, as far as uh, tips for staying up to date, as it were. Um, <laughs> that's that's something I kind of uh, is an ongoing battle for me in my uh, uh, my normal work with in my PhD work. So <laughs> I I can't say I have any uh, foolproof tips on staying up to date. The, the major societies will generally come out with guideline updates every you know three to five years. It varies on the society, and they're often staggered. Um, but the AHA, the American Heart Association. American College of Cardiology are both good sources of, of uh, guidelines. They're a bit dense for the layperson to read, um, but, but are a good source. I mean, I, I, at the same time, I think that there will very likely um, be a, a constant, which is, you know, the stuff that none of us wants to hear, which is, you know, exercise, fruits and vegetables, um, 
and the like. I think that will never change. All right. So I've got a lot of questions in the chat, but we also have a second talk coming up. Um, and some of those questions may be addressed in that talk. Um, and if not, we can address those questions after Dr. Worka's talk. Um, so with that, we'll take a brief uh, five minute break. We'll, we'll return at 7 p.m. Eastern time and we will uh, get started on Dr. Worka's talk. Um, again, thanks all for coming and we'll see you in about five minutes. Uh, Dr. Robert Werka. He um, is currently an assistant professor of medicine and cell biology and physiology here at UNC. Um, he completed his medical training at Case Western Reserve University and did his internal medicine, internal res and internship and residency at the University of California, San Francisco, and then did his fellowship in cardiology at Stanford University. Dr. Worka is a physician scientist who uses human genetics to undercover new mechanisms driving coronary artery disease. He is motivated to study the molecular drivers of coronary artery disease with the goal of identifying new therapeutic targets that can reduce the burden of coronary artery disease on the public. By studying the genomes of patients with coronary artery disease, um, he can identify signals in the human genome that point to the most critical genes and pathways to target coronary artery, artery disease. Dr. Work is a really great guy. He um, is an incredibly talented physician scientist, um, and he's a personal mentor of mine uh, serving on my PhD thesis committee. So uh, without any further ado, Dr. Work, I thank you for speaking tonight, um, and we're excited to hear what you got to say. Thanks so much, Nate, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. It's very kind of you. Let me share my screen here. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Okay. Um, it, can everyone see my pointer? Okay, great. Um, so thanks everyone for the invitation. Um, I am a, a cardiologist and, and a scientist, um, and, and you'll see that um, bias in what I choose to talk about this evening with re respect to nutrition and cardiovascular disease. Um, now this is, I was told this is a mini medical school. And so I put the emphasis on the medical school. Um, and so there are parts of this talk that you might wish to just let wash over you, uh, and sort of gain a sort of general understanding about, you know, the kind of things that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, other parts might be of more interest to you. Um, and so, um, uh, I welcome any feedback on that. Um, I've got nothing to, uh, to disclose. So I'd like to organize uh, this evening talk into roughly two parts. Um, the first overlapping a little bit with uh, what Ben had uh, talked about uh, regarding the basic pathophysiology and pathobiology of coronary disease. And then um, one of my goals for you all tonight is to help you become more savvy consumers of medical news in distinguishing particularly correlation versus causation in many of um, the studies that are uh, that are constantly bombarding our inboxes. Um, and then I, I'd really like to talk about the role of, of lipids in coronary artery disease as they are a, a, a big driver. Um, and uh, in part two, we'll, re we'll really start to talk about the diet aspect and how the, the diet, uh, the foods that you eat, uh, can influence these underlying risk factors uh, um, that influence the biology of these lesions. Okay. Oops, hold on a second. I can't seem to advance my, okay, I have to click. So uh, like Ben, uh, you know, I'll introduce the coronary anatomy briefly. And it's strange that we're talking about cardio, you know, um, cardiovascular health or, um, you know, cardiovascular is really two parts. One, cardio is the heart, vascular is really the whole vascular tree. Um, and we're focusing on, on the, the blood supply to the heart tonight so much because um, it really impacts the, the myocardium, the, the heart muscle itself. And, and that has a, a number of manifestations 
um, you know, for uh, uh, and a lot of uh, implications for for heart health. And so, the coronary blood supply um, it, it originates in the aorta, which is the the main uh, um, uh, place where the main artery where where blood leaves the heart. Um, and goes to the rest of the body. Um, but there are two openings, one on the, the right that gives rise to the, the right coronary artery, which goes along the side of the heart and along the underside in most cases. The other is um, an opening sort of on the left front side of the heart, which quickly branches into the uh, left uh, anterior uh, descending artery um, and the, the left circumflex uh, coronary artery. And these supply both the front left and the, the left side of the heart. Um, and so really there are two, two narrow openings keeping your heart and thus you alive uh, at any given moment uh, in time. Um, as Ben mentioned, atheros atherosclerosis is the pathological process that causes coronary artery disease. And if you look from left to right in the schematic of a blood vessel, the normal blood vessel wall is uh, made up of a muscular layer. Um, and on the outside of that, it, it's some, there are some other cells and nerves um, and inside the muscular layer is a layer of uh, endothelial cells, which are very smooth, slick cells that form the inside of the tube where the blood uh, passes. And these are very sort of uh, uh, smooth and, and don't uh, express molecules that don't let the blood clot. Um, and then the blood moves you know, very smoothly through there. Um, as I'll talk about, um, because of the accumulation of LDL cholesterol in the space between the endothelial cells, which line the blood vessel, and the, the muscular layer right next to them, there's this potential space that, that LDL, um, uh, LDL cholesterol accumulates and it causes inflammation. And this inflammation recruits inflammatory cells from the bloodstream, uh, which come in and try to gobble up the cholesterol. They don't succeed, they die, uh, they, they turn into cell debris, um, and uh, a number of other cells enter the plaque. And this gradually you know, over the course of decades, progresses um, into a, a full-fledged coronary lesion. Now, clinically, um, as Ben alluded to, there are two uh, different paths that any given coronary lesion can take. One, uh, if the lesion is, is, quote, stable, what we think of as a stable lesion, which has a sort of a robust uh, covering here over this gook, um, this will just continue in, in the presence of you know, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, all those risk factors. This will continue to progress until there's only a very small channel through which blood can flow. And at that point, um, patients can start to feel what we call angina, which is chest pain with exertion. When the, blood, when the heart is requiring more blood than that little channel can, can supply, the cells get angry and that causes pain and that causes chest pain. Um, this is a fairly stable situation. It's not a good situation, but someone with angina um, that's stable um, will often come, come in and get medical interventions, sometimes stenting to open that up um, and they'll be on their way. Uh, the alternative um, fate of a lesion is what Ben outlined, which is in, maybe it doesn't have such a, a thick protective cap here. Um, and for a number of biological reasons, uh, that cap can be can can rupture, and when it does, it exposes the blood flowing past all that gunk, and that causes it to clot. So, what was a fifty percent lesion uh, turns into a hundred percent lesion because the blood is clotted there in a matter of seconds to minutes. And this is what we as cardiologists really worry about. This is why we're called in in the middle of the night. This is why someone walking down the street feeling fine can keel over. And, you know, with chest pain and have a major event is because this can happen very suddenly. And it really just depends on the biology of the plaque. So some plaques are more stable than others. On average, the larger the plaque, the more risk the plaque is for rupture, but that's not always the case. And so it, it makes it very tricky for us. You know, occasionally there are 30, 50% lesions um, that can rupture and cause 100% lesion in a matter of seconds to minutes. And so it is very challenging uh, many times to, to predict these events. Um, and it's something that I'm trying to understand in my, my basic science laboratory here. Um, this is just an example uh, of a, a fluoroscopy during a, a catheterization. The, here's the catheter here. Um, this is so we, we basically, and I say we are, my interventional colleagues go uh, through, the, through the wrist mostly. Um, they snake a catheter, which is a long plastic flexible uh, tube that goes right 
um, where the, the aorta meets the heart, where the coronary uh, arteries come off, and they stick the catheter in and they, they inject a little bit of, of contrast dye. And this is what you're seeing. So this is the catheter and this is the coronary artery. This is the right coronary artery. And this is an example, I mean, you guys can see here that it's a you know critical stenosis here. This should be a, this is all dye flowing through the artery and, and this should just be a long normal tube here, um, but this is a critical stenosis. Um, here's another picture, uh, again, with the right coronary artery, here's the catheter entering the, the right coronary artery. You see here, it's a nice tube and then it stops all of a sudden. This is an example of a thrombotic occlusion, which is what happens when that plaque ruptures and cuts off the blood supply completely. Um, on the right, the interventionalist has wired the lesion, ballooned it, and put a stent in. And, and this shows the, the lesion after it's been opened. And you can see here some residual disease in the, in the distal um, posterior lateral branch. Um, all right, so what the reason that we fix it, one of the reasons I alluded to that we fixate on coronary disease is because um, it affects you know, when you, when you get a, 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 when you have a heart attack, it, it, the muscle dies and that can cause the heart muscle to be weak. And it's the most common cause of heart failure actually is, is uh, ischemic heart disease, coronary disease. So it, it causes a part of the heart muscle to die and it's not pumping as well. The body has a bunch of maladaptive responses, which make it worse. And, uh, and it can be a bad deal. Um, the same, same thing, um, you know, a heart attack, can cause arrhythmias, which are, are either very slow or very fast abnormal heart rhythms that don't allow your heart to really maintain your, your cardiac output and your blood supply to your body. Um, this can happen during a heart attack um, because the heart muscle is irritable, or if a scar forms in the heart where the, where the muscle has died, that can cause a, sort of a loop, an electrical loop there around the scar that can cause arrhythmias. Um, and so coronary disease is really, a, you know, we think of cardiology in terms of, you know, the heart is kind of a, an old house. You know, some cardiologists are plumbers and work on the coronary arteries. Some cardiologists are electricians. They work on the heart's wiring and others are, uh, you know, the, the mechanic that work on the heart's pump. Um, and so, but, but coronary disease really affects them all. And so the things driving coronary disease, we know has been alluded to are high blood pressure, which also predisposes a heart failure. Um, LDL cholesterol, we'll get into that, tobacco and diabetes, obesity, um, and the like. And so these risk factors are, are what we're going to talk about really tonight, um, trying to, to stave off coronary disease, heart failure, um, and, and arrhythmias, which are, are plaguing um, most developed countries. Okay, as I promised, a little bit of pathobiology of atherosclerosis. So this is, imagine that, that tube here, this is a zoomed up view of, of the artery. On the top is lumen where the blood is flowing past the endothelial layer, which is this, this single cell uh, thick layer that interfaces between the blood and everything underneath, that's here. Here's this intima, which is that potential space between the um, endothelium and the, and the smooth muscle cells, which are the muscular layer of the artery. Um, and so really um, coronary disease begins, we think, um, as a confluence of, of a couple of factors. One is as endothelial damage, um, both from just normal anatomic wear and tear, different parts of the artery are, are exposed to different flow because it's not a straight tube, it's, a, it's a, you know, an arch and the arteries are tortuous. And so, um, and especially at branch points, you can get differences in flow, which can cause the endothelial cells to get a little bit inflamed and start expressing some, uh, getting disrupted and, and expressing some uh, molecules on their surface that, that call um, inflammatory cells. So you get some sort of endothelial damage. It, you know, elevated blood pressure exacerbates this. Tobacco use exacerbates this. Diabetes, you know, uh, excess uh, blood sugar uh, causes these cells to become damaged. Um, and so all of these things, this is sort of why all of these risk factors are accelerating the progression of atherosclerosis because they're causing endothelial damage. LDL is a persistent driver of atherosclerosis and this, you know, endothelial damage allows LDL to, to enter this intimidal space uh, more easily, but it, it likely does enter even in uninjured endothelium um, and, and it becomes oxidized and it really starts this chain reaction um, of uh, of, of inflammation, um, the endothelial cells call out to, to cells, the immune cells floating in the blood, they invade, they try to gobble up this, this LDL uh, macrophage, they turn to macrophages, try to gobble up LDL. They are 
initially successful, but ultimately through throughout decades, unsuccessful and um, actually just end up dying in their, their cell bodies end up, you know, wasting away in this necrotic core here. And um, anyway, and, and multiple cell types, including the, the vessel itself, um, adapt to try to gobble up these uh, with to no avail. And again, as I mentioned, the, the cells and the, the, the signaling pathways between these cells and the composition of these cells ultimately dictate whether this is a stable lesion and it just kind of grows or if it is vulnerable to rupture um, and, and causing that sudden heart attack syndrome that we were talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna go into lipids a bit. Um, so this is actually taken from my medical school textbook, a real textbook, they existed um, back in the day. And so when we eat um, fats, and cholesterol, uh, this is our gut, they're packaged into these large particles called chylomicrons. And these are all lipoproteins, which means that they're a combination of lipids and proteins that carry the lipids around the bloodstream. And so the chylomicrons enter the plasma, uh, enter the bloodstream, and they're, they're worked on by this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, which breaks the triglycerides in the plasma, in the, in the uh, chylomicron into free fatty acids and glycerol. And uh, those supply energy to the muscles and to the to the fat tissue um, and to various organs. Um, they're ultimately arrive, um, at the, they're taken up by the liver. They're kind of the, depleted of their triglycerides um, and are uptaken by the liver. Um, and the liver synthesizes cholesterol. It also takes cholesterol from these chylomicrons and it repackages it into very low density lipoprotein, which it excretes into the bloodstream to really give cholesterol and triglycerides and everything to the, to the body that, that need these things. Um, and so as lipoprotein lipase acts on this, progressively depleting it from you know, tri triglycerides, um, it gets smaller and smaller, it's more compact, and eventually it becomes LDL, which is our dreaded enemy here. Um, LDL um, does serve a purpose. It delivers cholesterol to, uh, to cells. And so it's needed to some level and to some extent in normal physiology. Um, so it's taken up by cells and, and provides cholesterol. Um, and then HDL, which we typically think of as the good cholesterol, is sort of the, the, the particle that shuttles cholesterol back um, from, from cells, especially cells that have too much cholesterol, um, and, and recycles it back, contributes it back to, to VLDL, um, which again is cycled into LDL. And eventually, uh, the vast majority of LDL uptake is done by the liver, by the LDL receptor, and that's ultimately secreted into the bile um, uh, which then uh, goes back into the intestines and is uh, excreted. But the liver, uh, the main message um, is there are multiple particles and they are often derived from each other. Um, and, um, but the liver is a main player in cholesterol handling. Um, and most of the cholesterol medicines that we'll talk about act in the liver, um, either to prevent the synthesis of cholesterol in the case of statins, HMG, CoA reductase inhibitors, um, or work on uh, molecules that impair um, the LDL receptor from doing its job. Um, and so, so those are the two main uh, drug targets that we use to modulate LDL levels. So this is, you'll note the date of this, these data are from 1979. So these are some of the original data from the Framingham Heart Study um, that first clued everyone into the fact that LDL and HDL um, were strongly related to to the incidence of coronary disease. And so here is just a, a, a plot showing with various risk factors, uh, systolic blood pressure, um, you know, low uh, and, and then higher uh, systolic blood pressures with varying levels of cholesterol going up that, that at each tier of blood pressure uh, 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 level, the more LDL cholesterol you have, the higher your risk for um, coronary events. Oops, sorry. Um, so this became known as, you know, a, a direct risk factor and, and that's why LDL is considered the, the sort of the bad cholesterol. Um, HDL on the other hand had the opposite association with coronary disease. Um, and here at any given level of blood pressure, you can see that as your HDL increases, your risk for uh, coronary heart disease events um, decreases. Um, and so this is uh, considered sort of the, the good cholesterol. Um, triglycerides is another thing that many of you might see on your test results from a doctor. Um, these are uh, packaged mostly in the VLDL and chylomicron stage, um, but, um, but um, triglycerides have been shown to be associated um, with, strongly associated with, with the risk for coronary disease as well. Um, so it's at this point that we talk about 
association versus causation. And so, um, you know, I just mentioned that all, you know, LDL, HDL, triglycerides are all associated with coronary heart disease. Um, and that can be seen sort of at the, the exposure, the lipid is the exposure and they're associated with an outcome. Um, the problem is, um, of uh, uh, the problem is confounding. And so an association um, can be oftentimes spurious. And that happens when a confounder, say a third variable, causes both an increase in the exposure and an increase in the outcome. And there's real, no real relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So as a, as a practical exercise, say that it was reported on the news um, that in a cohort of, of children, uh, that, the, that the children's shoe size was, was associated with their ability to read. And you can imagine all the parents going out and trying to stretch their kids' feet or buy them new shoes, larger shoes, in the hope that they'll be able to read better. But here we see a clear source of, of confounding, which is that the child's age determines both their shoe size and their reading ability, right? And so this is a, this is kind of a cute little example, but the, but the examples are, are much more difficult to, to suss out in real life. And many clinician scientists spend most of their careers trying to, to, try to weed through these, um, these confounding uh, variables. But if there is a cure, it's not a perfect cure, it's, it's randomization. And this is um, randomized trials. And so randomized trials cut through confounding by um, taking a large group of people and randomly assigning them uh, to one or more treatments. Um, and, and this assures that, um, well, it, it comes as close to assuring as best we can that, um, that the, the, there's no, that it takes confounding out of the, out of the picture um, and people are, are uh, chosen equally for each of these. Um, and so this is what it typically looks like. You have you know, patients that are assessed, some are excluded, and that's something you, that people need to pay attention to, but ultimately a certain number undergo randomization, either receive some, in some cases, a placebo if it's ethical, um, and then an intervention, um, and then they're followed. Um, you see, see if they leave the study or not, um, and then you assess the outcomes in each arm. One of the assumptions of randomization is that both treatment and placebo or both treatment arms are, are have equal baseline characteristics. And that's why the boring table one of every randomized controlled trial is, is the patient characteristics showing indeed that there were no significant differences between multiple you know, important facets of their, of their baseline health. Um, one thing that I'll just very briefly touch on uh, is the concept of Mendelian randomization. This is a clever technique that uses genetics. Um, so taking a large group of people um, and looking at their, uh, their a gene uh, at a certain location that, that modifies the gene's function and comparing those people. And the idea is that the patients are sort of randomized at birth to receive one, you know, a different variant of this gene, which influences the level of that gene uh, throughout their entire life. Um, and there are a lot of pitfalls, um, a lot of confounding that people have to get through, but this is a technique that's being increasingly used um, by, um, by pharmaceutical companies to uh, try to figure out whether a drug target that they're working on has, has promise. Um, so this is an example of Mendelian randomization. Again, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but this is Mendelian randomization of LDL. So in this case, they're, uh, it's showing people who have inherited different variants that expose them to different amounts of LDL. And here we see very significant associations with, with coronary disease. So over their lifetime, they, they're exposed to different levels of LDL and that impacts their coronary disease risk, suggesting that LDL is causal in the development of coronary disease. Um, and this is one of, one of the larger statin trials. Um, uh, so, statins, um, so statins lower LDL. Um, and so lowering LDL, um, they showed that lowering LDL with statin resulted in an almost 30% decrease in the risk of, of coronary events. Now it's kind of funny, this was done in 2002. And for any you know, medical student in the audience, this was compared to placebo in patients who are high risk for coronary disease, which is just bonkers now. Um, but this is where, where the evidence was back in the day, right? And so, um, so this was one of the bigger studies to show that, that, you know, that statins lowering LDL uh, meaningfully reduced events. Now, fast forward in the modern age, um, LDL lowering through a different mechanism, uh, targeting a molecule called PCSK9 also uh, results and reduced coronary events. Now this is on top of statins. So you're already on statins, high doses of statins, and you lower the LDL even further with PCSK9 inhibition and you reduce your events over five years. 
Um, one of the coolest things to me was um, that lifetime uh, lowering of LDL demonstrated an even more dramatic benefit. So in this case, we have um, a, a mutation in the PCSK9 gene that renders it non-functional. And, and when that happens, patients um, have a lower level of LDL throughout their entire life. They're born with this non-functional PCSK9. And so from the time they're babies, they have much lower LDL than the normal population. And so this is illustrated sort of the normal populations uh, on the x-axis is their LDL levels. This is the distribution of LDL levels. And in patients with this mutation, they had obviously much lower LDL levels. Well, their risk, their, their risk for coronary disease was, was reduced by 88%. Okay, this is not the 30% that we see in the statin trials. This is a result of low LDL over time. And so the, the message of this slide really is that it's not just LDL lowering, but it's the area under the curve. The, 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 the lower the LDL that your blood vessels are exposed to over your lifetime, the, the lower risk you have of developing coronary disease. Okay, on the other hand, uh, HDL um, is, I'm not gonna go through this too much, but, but really this is the only um, allele that affected HDL and it's not significant. Um, triglycerides uh, were likely significant, so triglycerides are likely causal, um, although we don't have anything to target them um, directly at this point for coronary disease. But, but HDL, even though it's strongly associated, inversely associated with coronary disease, it, Mendelian randomization predicts it not to be actually causing or protective against uh, coronary disease. And sure enough, that was borne out in the trial. So increasing uh, HDL by giving people niacin had no effect on coronary outcome. Uh, coronary disease outcomes. Similarly, uh, people, numerous drug companies tried to increase HDL with an uh, inhibitor of one of those enzymes that I talked about on the, on the previous slide. So CETP inhibition um, increases HDL, but has no effect on, on uh, their incidence of coronary disease. So, so this is really pointing to us that, that this good cholesterol that everyone talks about is really just a marker of a reduced risk for coronary disease, but is not actually, you know, if you actually change HDL levels artificially, it doesn't, it doesn't do any good. In contrast, LDL is clearly causal. And when you change LDL levels, you have a dramatic reduction um, in coronary disease risk. Okay, so I've outlined some factors that, that put people at risk uh, for coronary disease. And so we'll switch into the, into the role of diet here. Um, I accidentally got out of there, okay. Um, so, um, the, the guidelines, the ACC AHA guidelines, uh, begin with um, recommending a sort of Mediterranean style diet. Um, and that was, you know, there are, it's very difficult to do randomized, you know, high quality randomized control trials of diet um, in, in patients. Um, but there was one uh, that was fairly high quality um, called the PREDIMED study which randomize patients to a, a Mediterranean diet or a sort of just generic low fat diet. Um, and I've put up the table here um, uh, to, you know, just to sort of illustrate the differences, but, but the Mediterranean diet is really rich in olive oil, tree nuts, um, fruits, vegetables, fish, um, something called a sofrito, which I learned is, yeah, I don't know, cut up vegetables and olive oil and sauteed. Um, uh, and then discouraged is, Things like that Ben already spoke about soda, processed goods, you know, um, margarine, meat. Um, the, the control diet um, was generally what we think of as a pretty, actually not a bad diet. It's, you know, low fat dairy products, it's breads, really not talking about whole grain breads necessarily. Um, and they discouraged sort of similar things, but also some, some of the, you know, the nuts and, and vegetable oils and essentially olive oil. And they discourage the sofrito. So maybe that's the key to everything. I'm just kind of, I'm joking, but um, so, so they looked at, so they looked at the, the Mediterranean diet, which was enriched in olive oil and, and nuts and, and, uh, and fish um, and legumes and compared that to, um, there were actually two versions, one that was sort of olive oil rich and the other one that was nut rich um, and compared that to the control diet and showed that actually the, the uh, incidence of this sort of composite endpoint of, of uh, heart attack, stroke, uh, or death from cardiovascular causes was significantly reduced. Um, this was actually probably uh, driven mostly by stroke risk and, and not so much um, heart attack risk, but it, it's uh, intriguing nonetheless. 
Um, so what is, what, what is the mechanism? How can we connect this back to the fundamental um, risk factors of, that are driving coronary disease? So, so the, the Mediterranean diet compared you know, to the standard low-fat diet, there was a reduction um, in, in systolic and diastolic blood pressure uh, compared to the, the control diet. Um, the, there was a slight decrease in, in fasting glucose, which is a, a measure of, I guess it's uh, the higher the fasting glucose that is associated with, with pre-diabetes and diabetes. So lower glucose in the Mediterranean diet group. And then um, also uh, LDL is reduced in, in both the Mediterranean diet groups and not significantly in the control diet. And, and triglycerides are also reduced compared to the control diet. So these are all things that we know um, are, uh, are causal. And, and, uh, and the Mediterranean diet, however it does it, is, uh, appears in this trial um, to be influencing those factors in, in a good way. Um, one of the interesting, so, so this is, you'll notice in the title, this, you know, within the Mediterranean diet, less meat is associated with lower mortality. Now your, your alarm bell should go off at this point when I'm saying that, that something is associated with, with lower mortality, which means that they didn't do a randomized control trial. They just looked at the data and, and, and split it into people who were eating more meat or slightly less meat or, or not very much meat at all. And then they looked at their, their, their mortality throughout the trial. Um, and they showed that, um, so, so actually very low is, a, it's this um, vegetarian index. So very low actually means that they ate more meat uh, counterintuitively. So ate more meat, less meat, less meat, and not much meat at all. And so, you know, so the, the mortality was actually higher with, with those who had, you know, ate meat and it sort of a, a behaved quite nicely in sort of a dose response way. Um, but again, this is all just an association. So there's clearly caught, you know, risk for confounding here, say, for example, at, you know, just picking something out of thin air, educational status could cause someone to, you know, eat less meat. And there are other things about that that could cause their reduced mortality, for instance. And so there's no way we can control for that um, in sort of an observational association analysis like that. So buyer beware, um, but the data exist. Um, so, um, a word on sort of macronutrient content, which was sort of, uh, you know, alluded to in terms of protein intake. Um, this is a study from Eric, which is a large uh, observational cohort study um, in the US, uh, atherosclerosis at risk in communities study. Um, and this is fairly interesting, um, showing that um, at extremes of carbohydrate intake, like the low carb diets or diets that are very high in carbohydrates, uh, your risk, uh, mortality risk is relatively increased compared to sort of a more traditional kind of normal 50, you know, 45 to 55% carbohydrate diet. Um, and this also uh, depended on meat consumption in, in this cohort as well. So those with, that, that were consuming meat, animal fat and protein had a slightly increased risk uh, more, uh, mortality risk compared to those um, who were eating more uh, plant protein and plant derived fat. And so again, this associated with mortality should jump out at you, right? So, so this is just an association. It's just a hypothesis generating uh, data set, right? So we're, we're, we're not taking any conclusions from this, but, it, but you know, nonetheless, guidelines can be based on, on these observations. And I'm not saying that they're, it's not true. I'm just saying that it's not a randomized control study and is therefore prone to confounding. Um, okay, so, so fatty acids, uh, moving from carbohydrates to, to fatty acids. Um, there are several different kinds of uh, fatty acids. I'm not a lipidologist, um, but, um, but um, so, so saturated fat is generally what we think of uh, in, in this molecule. And here you don't see it, but there are a bunch of hydrogen. Each, each of these is a carbon atom here on this backbone and, and it's saturated with hydrogen atoms here. Um, this is what we think of as, as saturated fat. It's often solid at room temperature, um, convenient um, in, in that respect, has a higher uh, melting temperature, frying temperature. It's good for frying because of that. Uh, because the molecules can all sort of pack together and, and are sort of solid at, at higher temperatures. Um, there is, um, then, then we have, so there's saturated fat and then there's the, the remaining three are our unsaturated fats. 
Um, and of those flavors, there's the, there's the cis unsaturated uh, fat, which has a sort of kink in it here uh, caused by the double bond. Um, and that causes it to kind of it be bendy and, and therefore pack together less well at room temperature and is therefore typically uh, a liquid at room temperature as Ben alluded to. Um, this is probably the, the, the least harmful or, or the best type of, of fatty acid to ingest in a, in a diet. Um, these other two are uh, what we call trans fats which are not saturated because they don't have uh, hydrogens packing all the carbons. They have, some, they have some double bonds, but the double bonds are arranged in a way that the molecule is still sort of flat and packs together um, and is therefore added to things like peanut butter, um, and margarine um, to, to make them sort of solid at room temperature and more convenient for, for, uh, for people. I will note that, you know, someone asked the question about changing dietary guidelines throughout uh, time. And, uh, and it is true that, you know, um, that sat, you know, sort of saturated fat, you know, was the enemy when it was first discovered. Um, and, and then people sort of shifted this high carbohydrate diet and they tried to substitute saturated fat with these trans fats, um, you know, not knowing that the trans fats as we'll see um, are equally, if not more deleterious to, to cardiovascular health. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the guidelines can change, which is why I sort of alluded to sort of the fruits and vegetables and, and nuts and, and fish and legumes and the sort of the naturally occurring um, products that, that uh, you know, will likely be in the guidelines forever. Um, so here's saturated fat, um, the unsaturated fat, these are trans fats down here. Okay, so uh, again, an association. So this is again, people observing large amounts of people um, uh, and, and not doing an intervention, just seeing what they ate and, and how, what their mortality is. And here we see clearly that, you know, trans fats appear to be horrible from a mortality standpoint, um, as you replace carbohydrates with trans fats, um, and, uh, same with saturated fats are also bad. Um, and then we get into our mono and polyunsaturated fats, like olive oil and some of the, the liquid oils that Ben was mentioning, um, which if anything, you know, are associated with a slight decrease. Um, and keep in mind that sort of U-shaped carbohydrate curve, right? At, at either ends of the spectrum, it's not gonna be great. Um, if, you're, if you're adding a whole bunch of oils and you're already at 20% carbs, it's probably not gonna, probably not gonna be great, right? Um, so this is another, this is, you know, sort of a hallucinogenic slide um, from 1990, but it's a very interesting study where they, um, where they it's actually a randomized study um, which is why there's no association in the title here. It's trans fatty acids increase LDL and reduce HDL. Um, so what they did is they took patients, divided them up into three groups and exposed them to um, different um, fats for uh, different amounts of, uh, of time. And they actually, they were very rigorous and they, they took people and started them on the saturated fat diet, moved them to the trans fat and then moved them to the to the unsaturated fat diet. Others, they started on the unsaturated fat, moved to the trans fat, and then moved to the saturated fat. So they, there are all sorts of things in, in clinical trials that can mess you up over time. And so they, they corrected for that. What you can see um, is that you know, both the saturated, and, and this is on the, on the left, this is LDL measurements. Saturated fat and trans fat consistently caused elevated LDL compared to the unsaturated fat. And you can see this regardless of when they were started in the course of, in course of treatment. Um, so they're consistently elevating LDL. Trans fats are also um, decreasing HDL, which again isn't causal, but is a marker of underlying badness um, that we don't quite understand. Um, so, so saturated fat um, was bad because it increased H, it increased LDL, but trans fat was even worse because it increased HDL, it increased LDL, and it also decreased HDL as well. And so. Um, this is the first one of the first studies directly showing that back way back in 1990. Um, they likely trans fatty acids also likely increase inflammation. Um, again, this is a, a randomized study, it's a very small randomized study showing that uh, um, consumption of trans fatty acids uh, when they gave them trans fatty acids compared to un uh, uh, unsaturated uh, fatty acids that their C uh, their CRP, which is a, a marker of general inflammation, um, increased significantly. Although these are still pretty low levels because these were, um, these were otherwise healthy uh, folks. 
Um, also in an even smaller study, um, trans fatty acids increased other markers of inflammation. Um, and so, you know, as if there weren't already enough evidence uh, with the LDL and, and uh, the mortality data, um, you know, we have some, some just more mechanistic, potentially more mechanistic uh, understanding of why these might be um, associated with badness. Okay, um, fish oil has received a lot of attention um, lately. There have been a lot of trials um, for fish oil. Um, the most infamous slash recent has been the Reduce It trial. Um, I believe that was in 2018. Um, it was a fairly large trial um, that demonstrated in patients with coronary disease that fish oil, high dose pharmaceutical grade fish oil supplementation was associated, uh, well, actually resulted in, in reduced risk for uh, coronary events. Now, this is a, this is a high risk population of, of patients where almost any treatment has more benefit than in the, the general population of patients who don't have heart attacks. So this is a high risk population of patients who already had heart attacks um, and a very high dose of a very specific uh, omega-3 fatty acid called EPA. Um, usually they're a mix of uh, EPA and DHA, but this was pure EPA, very high dose. Um, and it was somewhat controversial because it was compared to placebo, which was mineral oil, which people thought might actually increase the risk for coronary disease a bit. And so um, in any case, it, it, in a meta-analysis, which is a sort of an analysis of a bunch of randomized trials together, uh, even with and without reduce it, there's probably a small Small, you know, small reduction in risk with with fish oil in patients that are high risk for coronary disease or already have coronary disease, um, and that that's likely because uh, you know fish oil ha has a uh, fairly strong triglyc uh, triglyceride lowering effect, um, and it can it potentially has effects on uh, inflammation as well and, co and coagulation. Um, it works on sort of the same pathway that aspirin does. Okay, um, finally, a little bit on, on, on blood pressure and, and sodium. Um, so as you, as you recall, blood pressure is a major risk factor for, uh, for coronary disease, but also for heart failure um, and stroke um, and, and many other peripheral arterial disease, many other conditions. And so, um, and so the, you know, blood pressure, you know, this is not an exercise talk, but I would say, you know, definitely exercise uh, is, is clearly critical, um, but sodium is also, sodium intake is also critical um, for probably many reasons, some of which we don't completely understand, but salt is probably effect, affects fluid balance to some extent, but also probably acts directly on, on the blood vessels to regulate nitric oxide and, and vascular tone and, and everything. And so, um, so this was a study um, again, this is, uh, there's no association here. So this is a randomized study um, uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, comparing uh, this DASH diet to a control diet. Um, the, the DASH diet was sort of a, a sort of healthy fruits and vegetables diet, which was healthier at the time than a standard diet. But um, they both had a commonality in their sodium levels. And so here, um, so the, the current guidelines recommend no more than 2.3 grams of sodium per day. We generally say two grams of sodium per day, um, just to make it easy to remember. And so keep that in mind, two grams of sodium a day is the, is the guideline. Here we have a high sodium uh, group, which was at 3.3 grams. And then this is kind of closer to the, to the guidelines. And then 1.5 is actually below guidelines. And what you can see is here's the systolic pressure, blood pressure and the, and the diastolic blood pressure is that as you reduced your sodium intake, as you were, as they were randomly assigned to, to reduce their sodium intake, uh, the blood pressure, both the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure um, fall significantly. Um, and actually in the control diet, high sodium versus the, um, the control diet, high sodium versus the um, DASH diet, low sodium, there was a difference of seven millimeters of mercury um, uh, between the, the two groups. So, um, and this is a randomized trial. So, um, so sodium restriction, uh, you know, I shouldn't say restriction, but low, lower sodium diets um, certainly can on a, on a population scale reduce blood pressure. Now there are some folks that, that are very sodium sensitive and others that are, are not so much sensitive and we don't really understand it's probably genetic and, uh, but, but, um, but certainly, you know, if, 
you want to avoid a blood pressure medication, if you're borderline, if your blood pressure is borderline, you want to avoid a medication, reducing sodium might, might help. If you're on a blood pressure medication or multiple blood pressure medications, reducing sodium will, will certainly help. And, and it actually helps more in patients with, with pre-existing hypertension than it does in, in people who have uh, normal blood pressure. Um, so what, what are some of the take home messages? I'm sure I'm not gonna satisfy everyone and hit every point uh, in, in a 45 minute lecture, but, um, but I, I think really the, the take home points are really emphasizing a, a diet rich in vegetables, nuts, fruits, oils, whole grains. I think that's gonna be sort of timeless advice. Um, unfortunately, the truest timeless advice is also some of the hardest to follow for many of us. Um, and, and so, um, but you know, so that sort of base and using meat and, and salt really sparingly, salt specifically less than two grams a day, especially if you have high blood pressure. Um, it, macronutrient content should be, you know, sort of normal, nothing extreme, no low carb, no uh, high carb, if anyone still does that. Um, uh, and then, you know, exercise is, is super critical. Um, and, you know, it's not mall walking necessarily. I mean, it, it should be, it should cause you some, some discomfort. Um, you know, you should be breathing hard, start slowly uh, and, and escalate slowly is what I always say to, to patients. Um, and if you're having, you know, chest pain, obviously that's not the kind of pain that you should be having with exercise, right? It should be, you know, uh, you know sore muscles, right? Um, so that's super important for all of the, all of the things essentially. Um, blood pressure, lipid profiles, um, obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, everything. Um, and then, you know, I, I was hope I, I hope that some of this kind of made you a more savvy consumer of medical uh, news. Um, you know, unlike your diet, take all medical reporting with a grain of salt. Um, be, always be look on the lookout for reports of associations in this day and age with, you know, so much data. Um, you know, anyone can look at a database and pick out two things that are correlated um, and uh, just by chance. Um, and there, there are a ton of those associations. And so um, just be aware of that. Um, and, and oftentimes in life, I found that subtracting is often more effective than adding. And so um, cutting out tobacco and processed foods and salt is a good place to start before, you know, loading up on your fish or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, Finally, you know, I, I really wish to, to impart that the LDL is a really big primary driver of coronary artery disease. Uh, Eugene Bronwald, who's a famous cardiologist at Harvard, gave a talk, I remember when I was a fellow, and he said that if we were able to lower LDL sufficiently, there would be no more coronary artery disease. And so, um, and I think after looking at the human genetic studies with low LDL over time, that certainly is, is quite possible. Um, and so, you know, if you're having problems with statins there now that there are, you know, other medications like PCSK9 inhibitors that, that are an option, um, but, but really take that LDL lowering seriously. Um, because as we age, there's, you know, we can exercise, we can have the right diet and absolutely those should be the, the base of everything. But, you know, many times as we age, it's just sort of inevitable that our LDL creeps up, our risk creeps up and um, the, that's why LDL lowering is, is, uh, is critical. So uh, with that, I'm, uh, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Dr. Worker, let me be the first to say that was a great um, way to present nutrition and diet and how we think about it in terms of cardiovascular health. That was awesome. And I think it hit all the main, main highlights that they teach us in med school. That was really phenomenal. Um, in order to sort of streamline the questions, because we've got quite a few, um, I think Kevin and I will just read out the questions to you um, just to make things go faster. Um, the first two questions we've got are from Marsha Brace and Chia Liu. Um, they're, they're fairly similar questions. Um, is there a way to reverse the buildup of plaques? And in the extension of that, um, does uh, exercise help reduce plaque formation that have already formed? Yeah. Um, I, so I think, um, with very intensive LDL lowering there, there can be very, very slight reduction in plaque. Um, it's not something that clinically that we rely on. 
Um, we generally think of, you know, when someone has an event, a coronary event, we, we, the general thinking is that we get their LDL down, get their blood pressure, you know, normalized, get their diabetes in control, get all these risk factors um, under control so we can halt the progression of coronary disease. We can halt them from having future events. Um, and that's really sort of what we think of clinically. Um, there have been some studies, you know, people using very sophisticated catheters, you know, down in the coronary arteries, measuring the, the plaque burden. And the, I think some, some folks have shown very, very, very modest reductions with very, in, you know, intensive lipid lowering therapy. But, but generally, clinically speaking, we think of all of these interventions as a way to halt the progression, not to kind of make your arteries look like you're 19 again. And even 19 year olds have evidence of fatty streaks and everything. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kevin's going to read the next one. All right. Yeah. From Rich Baldwin. Um, can you address high fructose corn syrup and is it really a poison like it's so often portrayed? Yeah. I'm, again, I'm, I'm not a sort of a nutritionist, but what I do know is that high fructose corn syrup is broken down very rapidly into the, it's building blocks and the, the fructose. And that generally causes a big spike in, in blood sugar, which causes a big spike in insulin production. Um, and that can, you know, the, the big spike in, in, in blood sugar can, uh, it can do that damage to the endothelial cells and everything, the blood vessels, like I mentioned. Um, and it, it, and the, the, the following spike of insulin can often, um, sometimes overshoot and cause people to be more hungry afterwards and then sort of have this cycle where they're eating, you know, high fructose corn syrup and then they get hungry and then they eat more. And, um, and so, um, and then obviously, you know, eating, um, uh, processed sugar increases your risk for diabetes and obesity. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just sort of very quick. It's a very fast, quickly processed form of sugar, which you, you know, you shouldn't be eating if you can avoid it. Um, so I guess it's not too dissimilar from other forms of processed sugar, added sugar in diet. It's more like the dose of it that you get at any one time, those foods. Yeah, I think it's, it breaks down particularly quickly. Again, I'm not an expert in the area, but that's my understanding of it. Um, and so um, I, I, you know, completely avoid anything with high fructose corn syrup, absolutely. All right. Um, the next question is, um, say you were somebody who is in their 70s, have no known risk factors. Um, should you get a test, test to check your coronary artery uh, diameter levels or are there any other screenings that you should do um, that would help catch this sort of thing? Well, I'd say if you're in your 70s, you do have a known risk factor for coronary disease, which is age. Um, and so, you know, even with normal blood pressure, no diabetes, no smoking, no family history of coronary disease, um, if you're 70, chances are you have some coronary disease. Um, whether it's clinically significant is another question. Now, specifically for coronary artery calcium uh, screening, we typically use that as a, again, as a screening tool. So if you don't, if you have a coronary calcium score of zero, then that's very reassuring. If you have non-zero calcium or, you know, low is sort of reassuring, but if you, in any case, if you have sort of some calcium, then I'm not really sure what to do. Uh, there. Um, and with a, with, you know, being in the seventies, you know, my, my recommendation would probably still be, you know, a statin at that point, um, uh, depending on the LDL level, of course. But so I, I think of coronary uh, artery calcium screening um, more sort of in younger folks or, or folks who come into the emergency room, maybe with vague chest pain symptoms. And, and we, we doubt that they have coronary disease. We can get a quick coronary calcium scan, if it's normal, it's very unlikely they have coronary disease. Although we are moving more towards just CT angiogram, uh, CT angiography, which uses, it's like a CAT scan instead of, um, um, the, the CT coronary calcium is just a CAT scan without dye. We, we typically use dye. So anyway, I, at, at 71, I don't know how much it would change my management, honestly. Um, but again, if you're interested in that, you should talk to your, your, your doctor. All right, another question from Susan Wilson that I think is really interesting. Why does cholesterol more frequently rise after menopause? That's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure someone has worked out the answer. Um, it, I'm sure it has to do with estrogen and progesterone and, and all that stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure why it does. Um, yeah, and, there, and there's not much you can do about it besides 
you know, me medication if your LDL is, is too high or, um, you know, trying to reduce your, I mean, your, your LDL is a mix of both your, you know, cholesterol intake and the liver's production of cholesterol. And so um, you have a little bit of control over it, but often, you know, not enough to get you where you, you need to be to reduce your risk. Um, so um, I don't know mechanistically why, but um, it, it, you know, what we know is that hormone replacement um, actually increases the risk for coronary, for, for all sorts of, you know, vascular, uh, arterial vascular disease, stroke, heart attack, and the like. And so hormone replacement sh shouldn't be used for something like that because it, it actually is likely increasing the risk. So um, I'm not sure of the mechanism, but, but we would deal with it the same way as we would if it was a man who just had gradually increasing LDL cholesterol. All right, next up from Cassidy Fox, is there any linkage between the amount of sleep an individual gets nightly and cardiac health and caloric cravings? You know, I, I uh, my, I'm, I'm gonna say that, you know, again, I'm a cardiologist and a scientist. I, my, my, my knowledge of this is limited to sort of the, the uh, medical news that I, that I read. Um, and so, you know, from what I understand, um, sleep, um, or the lack of sleep um, is definitely, um, you know, associated with uh, obesity um, and uh, likely increased blood pressure and 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 poor health in general. So, um, I I would say probably over time, if you're not sleeping a whole lot, you know, you're probably there's probably going to be some sort of negative effect. I, I'm not sure that I'd be able to quantify that. Um, and uh, I think I think that caloric cravings also. Um, there's only, I can, I can attest to that from my internal medicine uh, residency program, uh, that lack of sleep definitely increases caloric cravings. Um, but that's, a, that's anecdotal. Um, and so, uh, but I, I think that, that, that is uh, generally the case. All right. And then Diane was a bit surprised about people being advised to take supplements because there's not really any oversight. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big problem. Um, I mean, most of the time it's just a problem for people's wallets. Um, but sometimes, you know, there are medication interactions, especially if they're on other medications. Some of these herbal supplements are powerful inhibitors of liver enzymes that break down drugs. And then you you, know, you never know what you're going to get with that. And so I totally agree um, that it, you know, I'm not a, not a big, um, I'm not a big supplement fan um, unless there's high quality evidence behind it. Um, so I agreed. And then our uh, final question is from Charles Park. Um, can you briefly talk about stents and their long-term effectiveness? Yeah, so stents are, you know, pretty amazing. They've actually come a long way. Um, so, as I mentioned in the in the talk, when someone has a, a blockage or narrowing, um, the interventionalist puts a wire down, uh, and then they they thread a balloon over the wire. They inflate the balloon and open up the artery. They withdraw the balloon, and then they put another balloon with a stent crimped over it at that same spot, and they inflate the balloon, and they the stent. Uh, is crimped into place. Um, stent technology has, has uh, improved exponentially over the years. Um, they, they used to be these bare metal stents um, and uh, there was, there were problems. So the, the, when you get a stent in your artery, um, over time, the, the endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells that I mentioned will overgrow that stent like vines on a wall. And so they'll, they'll cover it up and eventually it will become part of the, the artery itself. Um, and the newer stents, the, the advance in the newer stents is that they're coated with um, these drugs that kill cells. And so the, the problem with the bare metal stents was that you would get very vigorous overgrowth of cells um, uh, on the on the metal because you'd be damp you, you kind of rip into the artery when you when you put the stent in and that causes smooth muscle cell proliferation and migration and so they overgrow the stent 
pretty quickly, too quickly, and it causes instant restenosis um, over a matter of months, and then you're stuck with a, a narrowing again. Stent technology has improved dramatically so that they're coated with these cell, these uh, drugs that actually prevent these cells from, from overgrowing the stent as quite as quickly. And that actually leads to a, quite a durable result. The caveat is that um, when blood is exposed to the metal, it clots. And so uh, with, the, with these drug looting stents that they reduce the risk of instant stenosis, but you have to be on blood thinners for, for a longer time, uh, preferably a year um, when you have these because they're preventing the stenosis, but at the same time, the, the metal is exposed to the blood for longer. So you need to be on these antiplatelet agents. Um, the, what I would say to you, the question is that it varies dramatically in, in patients. So I'll give you three situations. One, the patient gets stented, they, uh, they clean up their lifestyle, stop smoking, you know, uh, stop going to Taco Bell. What was that, the taco cleanse, Ben? Stop, stop doing the taco cleanse. And, uh, you know, and, and just, you know, take their statins and, and their blood pressure medication, everything is well controlled and they're genetically okay. And so then that stent could last them the rest of their life, 20, 30 years, say. Uh, another situation is someone who gets stented, you know, isn't really convinced to stop smoking, um, you know, keeps doing their taco cleanse um, and, uh, and has uncontrolled blood pressure, diabetes, that stent and many other areas in their arterial tree can, can uh, quickly uh, you know, uh, progress. And so that's a bad situation. There are other patients who are, who are clearly just unlucky from a stent perspective where they're doing everything right and they just repeatedly have their stents stenose. And this is likely a genetic thing in their, in, in their the propensity for their, their arterial cells to, to regrow over these stents and cause stenosis. Um, and, it's a, and some, a small percentage of patients really struggle with that where you, know, you, have, you have to keep putting in stents, and, but it's, it's, not, it's not common. Um, and so you know, if, you, if you do get a stent, that's your wake up call, right? You do everything you can to, to halt the progression of, of coronary disease. And, and very often we're successful doing that. And, and those, you know, the, the, the guy comes in, he's 90 and he had a stent in, you know, like 1990 and it's still fine. Right. Um, and so, um, so it, it depends on the, very much on the patient and you know, how they, how they do in terms of risk factors. And then, and then unfortunately a small, you know, percentage of patients have issues where, where they get stent stenosis. Okay. So the final, final question, it should be brief. Um, is it possible to remove stents or do they stay in forever? Um, yeah. They stay in forever. They're incorporated into the, into the vessel wall. There are, there are now um, biodegradable stents, which, um, which actually dissolve. And so they're not really removed physically, but they, they dissolve. Um, I'm not, not totally convinced there's a huge advantage to that. Um, but um, because most, you know, most of the stents that we have are, you know, they don't prevent you from getting an MRI or anything like that, or, you know, they're totally safe in terms of um, every other cause, you know, every other procedures that you, you might need. So um, there are bioresorbable stents. I don't, I'm not, I don't think they're very popular. Awesome. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Worka and Ben for your wonderful talks this evening. Uh, we want to give you all a round of applause. I'm sorry, it has to be a virtual one. Uh, but thank you both for taking the time this evening. Um, I know you both have families, um, and so we're grateful for your talks. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Always happy to have you talk. Um, Kevin, do you have any final words to say? Yeah, just thank you again to the audience for being here again tonight. We will try to get the recording for this upload in the next week or so. We're having some difficulties on our back end, so that's why I've been slow to get last week's up, but as soon as we're able to, we'll have both of these recordings up on our website, the UNC Mini Med School site. And yeah, thanks again for coming and we look forward to seeing you all next week. And next week's topic, interestingly enough, will be about hematology and blood clotting, which we touched on a little bit today about the clots that form in the coronary arteries. So um, stay tuned. See you all next week. Thank you again, Dr. Work and Ben. Absolutely. Um, before we log off, oh, it's gone. All right. Uh, let me stop.